As you see on the board this morning, we're going to talk about anger for a while this morning. We seem to live in a country that, or a world, that is angry. That anger, it seems to be intensifying. I think studies have shown that after the, the pandemic, after people came out of, of being secluded for a, such a long period of time that, that the anger has increased. We know that uh, through uh, the political divides that those have generated uh, animosity and anger amongst the different, uh, different groups. So we live in a, a country, we live in a society that seems to be getting angrier and angrier. And in an age where some of the most prominent preachers in America don't mention neither sin nor hell in their preaching, I find it very interesting that Jesus preaches against sin and warns against the consequences of sin, which is eternal uh, damnation or hell in his very first and most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to explore a little bit what, about what Jesus talked about in that sermon. But in an article by Rick Nowak uh, from CNN on December the 4th, 2011, titled, World War II bombs defused, allowing 45,000 evacuated residents to return. And he reports the bomb squads in Germany successfully defused on Sunday, two bombs and disposed of an additional airdropped military device that had caused an evacuation of the historic portions of the city in his country's west. Life had come to a standstill in the western German city of Koblenz, where 45,000 people had been evacuated after the discovery of several dangerous World War II bombs. For 65 years, the Rhine River had, two, had hidden two bombs and a fog-producing device that were dropped by an American and British warplanes in the last years of the war. When water levels dropped to a record low, uh, the bombs were finally found and deactivated, as was a common practice in Germany. And in this particular writing, it says the last year a bomb exploded in the German town Gottingen, killing three members of a bomb disposal squad. And you may ask yourself, well, why did they evacuate a whole town? 45,000 people were evacuated. That's because bombs have a kill radius. They have a, a blast radius, and you have to be out of that blast radius or, or suffer uh, dire consequences. And also in an article that was penned in 1994, and it was entitled, War's Lethal, Lethal Leftovers, Leftovers Threaten Europeans. And this was written by Christopher Burns, reads, the bombs of World War II are still killing in Europe. They turn up and sometimes blow up at construction sites, in fishing nets, or on beaches 50 years after the guns fell silent. Hundreds of tons of explosives are recovered every year in France alone. 13 old bombs exploded in France last year, killing 12 people and wounding 11. Unexploded bombs become more dangerous with time with the corrosion inside. The weapon becomes more unstable. The detonator can be exposed. And you may ask, well, what has this got to do with our sermon this morning or our lesson on anger? Well, what is true about undiffused bombs is also true about undiffused anger. Without any warning, unsuspecting victims can experience severe injuries from a massive explosion by someone's temper, their foul speech, and their uncontrolled tongue. How many people have been endangered by the old bombs? that's left behind because of the anger that we still have in our heart. Consider the danger anger holds for you and for those around you. This issue was so serious that it was the first, one of the first sins that Jesus preached about on the Sermon on the Mount. But how many lives have been devastated, families and relationships ruined by explosive anger and the kill radius of a bad temper that someone may have? We read in Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 21st through the 22nd verse. You have heard that it is said to those of old, 
you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. An article that was written uh, some time ago by the AP suggested that one of the most, few, uh, most famous feuds in American uh, folklore, the long-running battle between the Hatfields and McCoys, may have partly been explained by a rare and inherited disease that can lead to hair-trigger rage and violent out outburst. But there are many others that dispute these findings. So I'm not sure if that's actually true, if that exists, that particular uh, heredity, that inherited disease that he's talking about. But the article mentions later that the hostilities began with these two families. It resurfaced again in 2003 when the McCoy descendants sued the Hatfield descendants over visitation's rights to a small cemetery in the Appalachian hillside in eastern Kentucky that holds the remains of some of the McCoys that it is supposed that were actually killed by the Hatfield. This feud went on for generations. It was finally a treaty was signed by these two, uh, these two families that all of those hostilities would, would cease to, to occur. And I understand that they have family reunions where both of the families get together, where thousands of those, the Hatfields and McCoys, have, as they say, buried the hatchet. But you know, when you think about the anger and the hostility that occurred between those two families during that, the, the height of that, uh, of that feud, it was, uh, by all accounts that I've read, it was fearful to be even breathing or even walking around in the woods or wherever it might be for fear of being killed. Many of the people that participated in that didn't really know how it even started. They just were carrying on the tradition of hatred. Everyone acknowledges the murders that, that occurred during that feud of the Hatfields and McCoys and, and many and other murders in general. Violate the law of God, but Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount that wrongdoing occurs before the actual murder ever takes place. And referring to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, Jesus teaches one way in which our, our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. He said in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rachel shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. These verses we read just a moment ago. The religious leaders of that time believed that as long as their anger or hatred didn't spill over to where that they would murder someone or kill someone, that, that they were okay. But Jesus takes another step forward and he sets the record straight. Matthew 5 and 22 is the only message in the Bible where the term raka is used. Raka comes from the aromatic term riga and it was a derogatory expression meaning empty-headed, insinuating a person's stupidity or inferiority. Inferiority. <laughs> In other words, it was a, a word that you would, or an insult that you would throw at someone if you were angry. It was an offensive name used to show their utter contempt for another person. And Jesus warned that the use of such a word to describe someone was tantamount to murder and deserving of the severest punishment of the law. Because Jesus knew that murder starts within the heart. He knew that anger starts within the heart. He knew that anger within someone's heart was going to lead to, it may not lead to physical murder, but it would lead to something that was akin to the murdering someone. How many people do you know that their reputation has been ruined by angry words that someone threw that at them? How many people do we know that through angry words and through the hatred of someone else that, that they have been devastated? Many times, 
and we're going to talk about abuse in here in just a moment, but an abusive tongue can inflict harm upon someone that is lifelong lasting. You know, they say that the, the bruises of abuse will may soon fade, but the abuse and the bruise that a tongue can cause may last forever. In Matthew 5 and 22, or I'm sorry, in Matthew 5 and 21, when Jesus recalled the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, which was referenced in Exodus 20 and 13, in characteristic fashion, Jesus took the old law one step further by explaining the true significance of the law, a deeper spiritual meaning that they had not heard anyone speak about or not seen before. First, Jesus warned that the very act of murder finds it in the root of anger, a murderer spirit. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Matthew 5 and 22. God who examines the very thoughts and intents of the heart will issue judgment upon the unrighteous anger. Some believe that this reference to brother here may even allude back to the brothers uh, of Cain and Abel when, when Cain killed his brother out of anger and jealousy. Next, Jesus warns against name-calling using Raka as an example. Then he issues a third warning against those who would call someone a fool in verse 22. The first century Jews recognized that anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. Matthew 5 and 21, but Jesus warns that even name-calling or insulting someone, such as use of this word raka, is sinful. Murder begins in the heart. And words such as raka are signs that there is a hatred lurking within. Many times when we see someone hurling insults at someone else, there is a deep-rooted hatred within their heart. It may not lead to the physical murder of that person, but, but uh, as we mentioned a moment ago, words can be extremely harmful. The hatred that causes one person to hurl insults is the same hatred that causes another sometimes to commit murder. The attitude of the heart is the same and it's attitude that makes a person morally guilty before God. I think that's what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus not only warns us against expressing unrighteous anger, which will lead, could lead to murder or other physical abuse, but clearly commands that disparaging comments and name-calling should be avoided. Such abusive words reveal the true intents of one's heart and mind for which we will be held in judgment. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Jeremiah 17 and 10, 1 Samuel 16 and 7, and 1 Chronicles 28 and 9. Clearly, Jesus is teaching that we must do more than avoid the murder that he, that's being referred to in the old law. We must avoid the bitterness, the anger, the hatred that leads to that type of physical action. The Holy Spirit tells us in 1 John 3 and 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer shall, has eternal life abiding in him. Now here, this reference to, to brother is not necessarily referring to a sibling. It certainly includes male and female, brother and sister, in this, in this particular passage. When we fail to control our temper, we do not say that which is harmful or foolish. When we don't control our tongue and our temper, we can, as we mentioned a moment ago, we can... Uh, harm someone eternally. We can harm a relationship that we may have once had that will never be the same. Or we may commit, but our tongue may cause us to commit sin. And we want to make sure that we control that, that inner anger, that unrighteous anger as it's referred to. Jesus taught in His great Sermon on the Mount the moral code His followers should live by. A moral code that far exceeds mere formal adherence to the old law. Christ's disciples obey their, their king because they are committed and loyal to him and one who has conquered their whole heart. What does that mean, conquering our whole heart? 
when we conquer our whole heart, we bridle our tongue. We conquer, we may get angry. And we'll talk about that in a moment because it's human nature that we will get angry. But it's how we deal with that anger. How long we let that anger subside in our heart that really uh, makes a difference. True Christian servants seek to follow God's instruction to deep to its deepest heart application. They don't merely satisfy the bare minimum, the bare minimum of this requirement. This principle prompted Jesus to say, "Agree with your adversaries quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison." Matthew five and twenty five. In context here, Jesus is focused on the topics of hatred and anger. And you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to the judgment. But I say if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. This is a new, this is the NLT version. You shall not commit murder was the letter of the law we read in, a moment ago in Exodus 20 and 13. It's also in Deuteronomy 5 and 17. But Jesus dug down e deep into the heart of that matter of that command, didn't He? Which was hatred. Members of God's kingdom must do away with all hatred and anger. And Jesus set forth the example of a believer needing to reconcile with another believer. So if you are offering your gift at the altar in their room, and you, there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Jesus insisted that we not allow quarrels and resentment to fester and to get, and to get ourselves right with our brothers and sisters in Christ as soon as we become aware of an issue. Not to let that, fist, that issue fester and not let it grow in hatred and, and contempt in our heart. We cannot expect to please the Lord in our worship while bitterness and anger are left to fester in our heart. The second example Jesus gave was the two feuding people about to appear before a judge in court to settle a disagreement. To agree with your adversary quickly is to settle your differences quickly. And Jesus urged his followers to settle matters face to face sooner rather than later while you are in the way. You know, they didn't have social media, email, text, messages back then, certainly. But I don't believe this is a condemnation, condemnation of those forms of communication. But I do believe Jesus is telling us that if we have a disagreement with with a brother or a sister, we go to them face to face to settle that. We don't do it over a text message. We don't do it over an email. We don't do it over some Facebook social media platform. We go to that individual face to face and we look them in the eye and we settle those differences. Amen. You know, the Los Angeles Times reported in uh, several years ago that a, a 260 pound University of Kansas football player tried to cry, uh, climb through a Taco Bell drive through window and he was so big that he crushed the window and he was stuck in that window. What he was trying to do was to attack the employee that hadn't put a, a chalupa in his bag. He became so angry that he tried to attack that employee and in that, that whole melee became entangled in the drive through window where he was, he was later caught by the police, arrested. Individual missed his last game of that season. And his actions also had an impact on his pro career as well. What was that all over? A chalupa. You know, how many times have we became angry at someone and when we stop and really evaluate why we're angry at that individual, we realize just how trivial it is. We realize how trivial the argument is that may have separated us that we need to, to make correct. We need to 
forget about that chalupa and go on with our life. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7 and 9, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. We can see in this example of, of the Taco Bell and this individual that we often fail to see that and realize it in ourselves. Because we allow our tempers to flare, we allow our mouths to outrun our mind many times. Fourteen centuries ago, so-called Gregory the Great labeled anger one of the seven deadly sins. Even sin, every sin is deadly. But we often downplay anger. And I'm not sure why that is. I guess it's human nature. But we downplay anger that Jesus has specifically said is equivalent to murder. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the U.S. During one year, this equates to more than 10 million women and men that are abused. One out of every four women and one out of every nine men in the United States are victims of domestic violence at some point in their lives. Up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually and it is a national health problem. Road rage. In 2023, of the people that were polled, 92% witnessed an act of road rage in the past year. A total of 12,610 injuries and 218 murders have been attributed to road rage over a seven year period in the United States. In 2022, someone was shot and killed in road rage incident every 16 hours. That's an unbelievable statistic. School violence in Tennessee alone, from 2019 to 2021, a total of 22,855 crimes were reported by the Tennessee law enforcement agencies. And the location code was school. And this was elementary and secondary schools. Nearly 350 school shooting incidents occurred across the U.S. in 2023. And from 2018 to 2023, more than 1,200 school shooting incidents occurred in the U.S., resulting in more than 1,200 victims, children, and school officials. Violence is indeed in sports. We read about fights after games. We read about players getting into fights. We read about racial violence. We read about political violence and just violence in general. You know, some cities, I wouldn't want to walk down the streets. Many years ago when I had to go to Detroit, we had to go, we had a project that we were working on downtown. And each each weekend, we would fly into, into Detroit and we would go downtown. Many, many times we would be, get there after midnight and we would have to go from where we had to park to our hotel. And then me and the other fellow that went with me, we were pretty good at sprinting, pulling a suitcase. Because you didn't want to get caught out in the area where we were at. We showed up one, one time, it was around the 4th of July. And the hotel that we were staying at downtown had put razor wire around the front of their, their hotel. And when we, we thought that was uh, <laughs> pretty interesting, quite frankly. And when we inquired, they said that the crowds got so angry and so rambunctious that they had to protect their, their property. And sure enough, that very evening or that, that night when they had the fireworks, the park that they had it in was not too far from where we were. There were several people that were shot because they wouldn't give this one individual a cigarette. You know, it, it's, it's just amazing to me where individuals can walk into a Walmart or they can walk into a grocery store and not or walk into a school and not feel safe with their life. 
it absolutely breaks my heart when we hear about uh, abused children, we hear about children that are murdered in their classroom. I don't understand the mentality of the individuals that do it. The problem Benjamin Franklin put it this way, anger, anger is never without a reason, but seldom is it a good one. Sometimes there is a good reason for anger, Paul writes in Ephesians 4 and 26, be angry and do not sin. He's telling us there that we may get angry, but we don't allow that anger to cause us to sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Anger is a God-given emotion. Just like joy, just like laughter, like all the other blessings that God gives us, anger is an emotion that we, get, we have from God. Sadness and fear. Anger is a gift from God, but just as we can pervert other gifts of God by misuse, you know, sleeping can become slothfulness. Eating can become gluttony. Marital int intimacy can be traded for adultery and so on and so forth, so forth. So anger too can cross the line. So should we never get angry? I think it would be good if we could, but we all know that, that there are going to be times that we get angry. We get upset about something. It's how we deal with that anger that makes the difference. The Bible says in Psalm 7 11 that God is angry with the wicked every day. Anger can energize us in righting or wrong. It can serve as a catalyst for resolving personal conflict. Jesus' anger was certainly justified in Matthew 21. 12 through 13, when he overthrew the tables of the muddy changers in the temple. He said afterwards, It is written, My house shall be, shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And William Sector said, He that would be angry and not sin must be angry at nothing but sin. You know, some circumstances should make us angry. We should be upset about innocent children being abused or aborted. We should be angry when sin is paraded uh, and justified as a lifestyle. We should be angry when God's word is twisted and corrupted. And David wrote in Psalms 119 and 104, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Unfortunately, we, are, we often get angry when we should not and we fail to get angry when we should. We can usually recognize the difference by asking ourselves, am I angry because someone else is wounded? Am I angry because God's word or the church has been damaged or maligned or endangered? Or am I angry because of selfish reasons? Because my pride has been wounded or I've been cheated in some way? And even in, even these selfish reasons, Anger is not out of place if it is handled correctly with resolution and rec re, uh, reconciliation that is sought appropriately. We must be careful, though. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 and 31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And in a similar passage in Colossians, the third chapter and eighth verse, the Holy Spirit says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Inappropriate anger. Being angry, angry too long and angry too often sometimes leads to physical health issues. Uh, Dr. Henry Brandt, one of the nation's leading psychologists, success suggests that anger is involved in 80 to 90 percent of all counseling. Uncontrolled or unresolved anger can lead to emotional and mental problems, including depression, eating disorder, alco uh, alcohol and drug abuse, self-injury, injury, low esteem and moodiness. Anger contributes to, a lot of times, to marital instability and abuse of marital spouses and children also. 
God wants us to avoid improper anger, not just because it hurts others, but because it hurts the individual that has this misplaced anger. And Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus addresses the effect of anger on our speech. He says in Matthew 5 and 23, And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. We mentioned these verses a moment ago, but I wanted to emphasize that once again. You know that many times we, especially when kids will hurl insults at another child. I want to speak directly to the children here for a moment. Because many times when, when you're young, you don't, you don't realize that how harmful those things that you're saying to another child may be. All children are not as blessed as you are. All children don't have a good home like you do. All children don't have the opportunities that you do to hear God's Word. Be careful about those insults that you may ingest, throw at another uh, peer at school. This also holds true for us as adults as well. Because many times we don't control our tongue the way that we should. We let our tempers take control of our heart. We let our tempers take control of our tongue. And the next thing you know, Satan has a hold of us. So serious is abusive speech that it is listed among uh, with the sexual immorality and adultery as sins that if left unrepented by a brother or sister, preclude our, and preclude our association with them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5 and 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an adulterer or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not to even eat with such person. Albert Barnes writes in his commentary on the railer and reveler, a reproachful man, a man of coarse, harsh, and bitter words, a man whose characteristic it was to abuse others, to, to vilify their character and wound their feelings. It is needless to say how much this is contrary to the spirit of Christianity and to the example of the master who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. We can diminish anger and its effects not only by what we say, but how we say it. The wise man writes in Proverbs 15 and 1, A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15 and 18 reads, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger also, uh, also contentious. Men are sometimes very fond of using uh, or quoting Proverbs 21 and 19. Better to dwell in the, the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. But the Bible also says in Proverbs 26 and 21, as charcoal is burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. A father gave his ill-tempered son a bag of nails one day and told him that every time he lost his temper, he was to drive the nail in the back fence. Well, the first day, the, the boy drove 37 nails in that back fence. But as the, the week went on, he began to get control of his temper. And each day he drove fewer and fewer nails until one day he didn't drive any nails. He was very proud of himself, so he went and told his dad that he hadn't lost his temper, hadn't drove any nails that day. So his dad told him to do this. For every day that you don't lose your temper, pull one of those nails out. So the little boy, he did that. And over a period of time, he had all the nails pulled out of that back fence. So excitedly, he went to his dad and he told his dad, Dad, I haven't lost my temper for all these days. I have all those nails pulled out. So his dad grabs him by the hand and he walks him out to that fence. And he says, Son, I want you to look at that fence. 
You see all those holes that are left in the fence? Those holes will be there from now on. Your temper put those holes in the fence. You may have gotten to the point where you no longer lose your temper and you remove those nails, but the result of your losing your temper will always be witnessed in that fence. Very sound advice, brothers and sisters. Modern day advances in communication have aided to the spread of malicious speech and degrading behaviors. You know, this is a story that is becoming far too frequent where a 14-year-old girl took her own life due to being bullied by other students. This happened just not too long ago. And we hear about that quite often. I even heard about a, a young lady who was convicting of urging her boyfriend to kill himself by suicide through text messages. What is this world coming to? You know, one of my favorite songs is entitled, Always Be Humble and Kind. It was sang by Tim McGraw, but it was written by five specific people. And these were the children of Lori McKenna. After dropping her youngest kids off at school, the songwriter <clears throat> sat down at her dining room table and, and wrote out, the principles that her and her husband wanted her, her children who ranged from ages 10 to 25 to always exhibit as they, as they grew older and to live by. You know, I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. If we're always humble and kind, we're going to, we're not going to abuse people by our speech, by our actions. We're going to take into account that they may have made a mistake, that they may have misspoken to us. They didn't really intend to, to do what they, they did to us. We're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I think if we use that kind of as a basis for our life, that we're always going to be Christ-like, we're always going to be humble, and we're always going to be kind. I think it's a good rule to live by. The lesson is yours. I hope we, through this study this morning, we have come to an understanding of how important it is for us to live a Christian life, to live a life where if we do get angry, we take care of that anger, we take care of the problem right away. We don't let life's problems fester in our heart we don't let life's problems ruin the joy that we have as Christians because we, have, we should have a joy beyond all others. For we have a promise that our Lord and Savior gave us that if we live the Christian life that He has prepared for us a place in heaven. In a moment, we're going to partake of the, of the communion I can't think of a, a, a well, there is no better example of someone who took all of the, the vile, all of the bad things that people did to him and he didn't reciprocate. Even while hanging on the cross in his tortured and battered state, he still did not speak evil of those that, that put him there. You know, what an example we have of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for our lives today. There may be one in the audience who would like to become a child of God. You have an opportunity right now. You may not have that opportunity after a while. Or if you, for whatever reason, you have strayed from, from God's grace, you have an opportunity to make those things right right now. God gave us such a wonderful thing. Not only did He give us uh, an eternal promise of eternal life, He gave us an opportunity of a second law of pardon. He knew that we would, as human beings, are going to make mistakes. But He's given us the opportunity to correct those things and He's given us the opportunity to do it right now. 
If you're so inclined, come forward as we stand and sing. If you like this sermon, do three things for me. Give it a thumbs up below, click the subscribe button, and share it with a friend either on social media or text. This helps the channel grow. It helps the word get out there. It's something really easy that you can do to affect the spreading of the gospel. This has been the Chapel Grove Church of Christ. Visit our website at chapelgrovechurch.com. We'll see you next time.